spinoffs. They can be one of the most confusing transactions on Wall Street, but also one of the most profitable. And it's actually really simple how profitable they can be. You just have to understand there's two key factors. Uh, Joel Greenblatt talked about in his book. I'll try to summarize it in this short video. Uh, two key factors of a spinoff, and it's basically the nature of the beast, and that's what creates the opportunity for investors. There's also been studies, uh, case studies of Joel Greenblatt himself making a lot of money from spinoffs, academic studies showing the returns on spinoffs. I have another study from Forbes, you know, not so much a academic study, but something that was very recent that showed the performance on spinoffs. And I'll show you some upcoming spinoffs and provide a couple thoughts for 2018 and beyond. So let me just break it down in as simple as a way as I can. So I will make an example, make it super simple, uh, and I'll show you exactly why there's going to be opportunity here and how we can use that to start to look for companies uh, in these new spinoffs. And obviously, you still want to do the same research like you always do, but there is a bigger chance at higher returns with things like spinoffs. So basic concept of it, you might have like a business, right? And let's say this is a factory and it's got smoke going up in the air, polluting our environment. And let's say they want to spin off. So they have like two main business models, right? They have manufacturing for, let's say like this poorly drawn train and it's got like a cool, you know, it's, it, it's a cool train. It's not a lame train. So that's why they make a lot of money, as you can tell by this great drawing. And then let's say they also produce train tracks. So management, you know, there, there's several reasons why there can be a spinoff like this. And basically what a spinoff means is we're taking this one big company and we're going to split it into two parts. Uh, there's going to be... Let's say um, let's say they're going to keep the train tracks because that's that's like their bread and butter and they're going to spin off the train business. So a couple reasons why uh, companies would do a spin off. Basically, one of the big reasons is sometimes a stock can be underappreciated by the market. And, you know, when like if you confuse these two business models, right, it can be hard to kind of differentiate what's going on um, unless you really get down into the financials. But when you split things up, then you can start to s like make the financial statements really clear. You can see what profits are doing with each business. Um, another reason is sometimes with businesses just get too big and you get like the, the whole corporate glut, right? Where uh, things are just too big and it'd be better if there was specialization, more focused teams. And so you, you kind of try to break down some of the bureaucracy that goes with corporations. And so they might break it down into two separate businesses like this. And, and it might be beneficial for both. Right. Uh, if you were to do that, same, same kind of idea with, with making the financials more clear. Um, you might not, for example, let's say, Let's say the trains have kind of always been known to be good and the train track business is kind of always known to be kind of good as well. And so like the market kind of looks at this as like, oh, it's a kind of good stock. But let's say that in reality, this is like a crazy good business and this is just OK. So by spinning off one of the two, like maybe this uh, railroad business keeps the main business's name then now, you know, the market might appreciate this business more and it's going to shoot that one up. And obviously that's great for management. It's great for shareholders. Two other reasons maybe why uh, they might do spinoff. Uh, it could be like tax or regulatory reasons. Uh, you know, sometimes companies get too big and, and before the Federal Trade Commission will break it up because of a monopoly. Maybe uh, a company might see value in doing that themselves so they have more control and, and things of that nature. So they might do it that way. And there also could be a reason where, let's say, this train business is actually uh, dragging this one down, right? So we're just going to spin it off, load it up with debt. And uh, a lot of times you probably don't want to invest in, in a situation like that. But Again, there's always documents and you can always look to see what's really going on in a business uh, in a spinoff. So you, uh, one of the key things is you want to watch what insiders are doing. And sometimes, you know, they do find these 
two beneficial kind of win-win situations. And so you're going to want to watch to see, like, are they exercising rights or are they getting a certain amount of shares in the spinoff? But let me talk about the opportunity. Let's, why are we going to make some some cheddar, right? As uh, Jesse Pinkman always says, make some cheddar, bro. So there's two huge, like, value unlocks that happen with a spinoff. And I'm going to write them here so that y'all can remember it. Number one, uh, think about this, right? So in a spinoff, let's say we're, uh, let's say we got 10 shares in the spinoff, right? Uh, this is factory business. And so what they're going to do, they're going to spin off this train business and they're going to keep, they're going to keep the railroad business and we're going to, uh, we're still going to call it factory business. Okay. But this is going to get spun off. So what usually happens is in a spin off, the shareholders here are going to get a certain amount of shares of this one. So let's say, I don't know, let's, because you're basically, you're breaking up the assets, you're breaking up the earnings and all that stuff. So shareholders need to get something back. Um, so your 10 shares here might equal, I don't know, eight shares here and two shares here. Let's just say that as an example. It's going to be different for every single spinoff. They're going to be structured a different way. But for the sake of example, let's make it a decent two. So this is the situation. Now, pretend you're, you're an investor in factory business. Well, maybe you got into factory business because back in 1777, uh, factory business laid the first railroad tracks through the United States, right? So maybe that was the whole reason why you bought shares in the first place. And then as they got bigger, then they started building trains and you're like, eh, that's fine. But you weren't really stoked about it. So as, as a shareholder who, who is in factory business for factory business and doesn't want a part of train business anymore, what do you think you're going to do? You're probably going to sell it. You're probably technical difficulties going to sell it. So, this tends to happen a lot and uh, something that Joel Greenblatt noticed is uh, a lot in a lot of spinoffs, the shareholders will sh sell the, the shares of the spinoff because it's not why they were invested in, in this one in the first place or they just don't like how things are developing, all these sorts of things. So we'll call them OG because it's going to be tough to write original. OG shareholders... sell now there's also a second kind of um value unlock this is fun there you go and that's the fact that you know look at wall street right yeah you have the average investors like me and you but there's also like institutional investors hedge funds and mutual funds and so they will have certain restrictions based on how their funds are set up. So a lot of times in the spinoff, uh, the new spinoff might be dealing in, in such a small liquidity size where the funds can't, like they're not allowed to hold them. Or they might be, uh, you know, the, the trading range might be off where, where they're only allowed to, to, to buy stocks within a certain trading range could be any of those factors and a lot of times uh they fall into a lot of the things with with the og shareholders where they're like you know what this isn't why we bought the stock we bought the stock for these railroad tracks we didn't buy it for the train i don't want the train business so we're gonna sell so now you have a second value unlock institutional there we go yeah, it looks better than my regular handwriting cool institutional sell also so now when you factor both of these in you know what's the stock market what's buy low sell high then you start to understand well if a if there's gonna be a bunch of selling when's the selling happening by the way it's gonna happen right when the spinoff happens so you have to think all these all this selling is gonna happen right at the time of spinoff What's that going to do to the share price? The share, the share, you know, 
uh, this this one, this share price, when it comes out and it goes public, it's just going to start like that. So now you can start to buy in here and you can there's a good chance that you can get a lot less than what the value because, you know, at the same time, the company doesn't want to just screw uh, screw over the new spinoff. Um, they might have share, you know, they might divide shares up and, and get some shares in it, too. So they want it to succeed most of the time. So they're going to try to set a fair price, give them a fair price, for whatever assets, whatever debts being spun off, all those sorts of things. But bottom line is that there's going to be a lot of in indiscriminate selling and selling, you know, it's going to be more selling than what what like regular sales would be. So you could be really getting these assets, these train assets, even if they didn't look so good when they were locked up in here. But now that they're unlocked and, and they're out on their own and there's maybe fresh management who's more specialized. And then now you have these two money making factors where the price just went really low and then you can buy in. And then the next year or two, it can really start to rise. And so that's what Joel Greenblatt saw. That's uh, with from his own personal experience from um, another study. I can't remember. It was like one of the Ivy Leagues who did this study. And it showed that like the first couple of years of a spinoff, uh, the stocks just always did crazy good. Not always, but, you know, in general, on average, these stocks outperformed really, really well. And so uh, this article by Forbes kind of confirms that as well. They looked at, <laughs> I mean, look at that headline, right? How could you not love it? Juicy, juicy returns in 2017. So they looked at all the 2017 spinoffs. And so, you know, you see really big returns. I mean, there's a couple of losers down in here. But for the most part, it seemed like almost every, a lot of the spinoffs outperformed the S&P. Uh, and some of them outperform by a lot. And so a lot of those things can happen from just those two phenomenons, like we said. Now, as a disclaimer, you're always going to want to be careful with spinoffs. Make sure you are reading, reading, reading. Because even uh, Greenblatt was talking about uh, not spinoffs. I think he was talking about like a merger case. Um, Yeah, it was a merger case. And he was saying how... Uh, even one of the reporters on, on Forbes or Barron's or one of those didn't even read it right and report it wrong. And it led a bunch of people astray. And, you know, these aren't the tip. This isn't as simple as buying a regular stock. So you have to be careful. In fact, I think if you're going to look into spinoffs, which can be very, very profitable that you buy this book and read his chapter on spinoffs. But without all that said, let's look at some spinoffs for, uh, 2018, get some thoughts and maybe some ideas moving forward. So this is pretty cool. Uh, I will link up both of these um, sites on the description because they're pretty useful. What I found interesting, this is the one I'm going to be watching for next year. Uh, I do have a stock, a competitor to this stock. So I'm definitely watching this very closely. Uh, and you might have watched my video on the polyurethane market. Again, that was just a couple days ago. And Dow DuPont has one of their, it's the material science, um, the material science business segment, business unit is in the polyurethane market. And so what's going to happen with Dow DuPont that's already been announced, it's just, we don't know what the details are going to be. It's summer 2019. Is they're going to split the three businesses into three separate companies and material science is going to be one of them. So that's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out because I'm pretty bullish on the polyurethane market. Um, just like as a general sense, you know, uh, I, I see it as being not like it's going to be crazy big, but it, it's going to have decent growth, at least average growth for the next several years. And so I think if you can find a player in there who, who's a major player, that could be, as great of an opportunity as any other market. The other one I find interesting, Disney and 21st Century Fox. So this one's uh, actually like a merger. Disney is going to be buying up a lot of uh, 21st Century Fox's assets. Uh, some of the same things that, that we kind of mentioned with the spinoffs and, and these two value unlocks can also happen in, in something like what's going to go down with Disney and, and 21st Century Fox. Now, they're going through like regulation stuff right now. Uh, we're talking about like regulation overseas, internationally and stuff like that. But 
uh, what I find interesting is shareholders of Fox will get, because it's an all stock transaction by Disney, shareholders of Fox are going to get uh, Disney shares. I think they're going to get some, some cash too, but basically uh, they're going to get some Disney shares out of it. And so I'm not a future teller or anything, but I'm anticipating that once the deal goes through, um, you know, not immediately. I mean, it might push the stock up because, you know, when it's official, then a lot of uncertainty gets gets taken out. And so the stock goes up. But I wouldn't be surprised if the, the first couple months after the whole thing is finalized and the dust settles, if you start to see some selling because of 21st century Fox shareholders who bought their their shares because they wanted to be in Fox and not necessarily in Disney. And so that that's going to work out that way because again it's an all stock merger which is different than a regular merger. Merger and acquisitions kind of the same thing. Um so that's something to keep in mind um and just something to look for. So I don't want to, you know, all of this to say this whole video to say is just because something's a spin-off doesn't mean it's a buy. However, I think it can make a value play even more valuable, especially if you can understand what's going on with the spinoff. So there's always SEC documents that, that go with it. So it might take you a little extra homework than like a regular stock pick would. But I just think there's so much opportunity, especially in the short term uh, and, and, and more like discount to intrinsic value and margin of safety that you can get from quick selling off in the beginning that it can really benefit you in the long run, especially if it's, if it's a business you want to own anyways, then you might, depending on, <laughs> depending on stuff, right? You might want to buy it before the spinoff, or you just might w want to wait until this kind of selling period and then buy in that business anyway, after the spinoff, it's all going to depend on you, your capital, what, what you're looking at for intrinsic value calculations, all those sorts of things. So I'm going to wrap up for today. Uh, I'm going to skip the usual spiel and just say I think you should subscribe to the YouTube channel. And that's going to be it for me tonight. Peace.